Hello, I'm Travis Atkins. I'm not Colic. I'm Travis Atkins. I'm grateful to be here. I'm grateful to be sober. Um, and as you all know, of course, I have a sponsor. His name's Andy. And as he said, yeah, today is my sobriety date. And um, I'm grateful to celebrating 13 years today. Uh, yeah, thank you all for making this birthday extra special by coming out and celebrating with me. You even have cake, huh? Um, uh, I, uh... I woke up today and I, I actually forgot it was my birthday. Yesterday I remembered, but today I just, I had so much going on that it just slipped my mind until I got a, a text message from a friend, you know, congratulating me and telling me, let me know she loved me, she's proud of me, you know, the usual stuff. And, um, and that, that's just kind of how it goes now. It's just another day, right? Um, the longer I've been in this program, the more stuff I get to do here, the more it just comes down to this, you know, I'm just, it's just another day. Um, you know, I've been relieved from uh, the problem. Like, I don't have to drink today. I've regained that power of choice, and it's just the immense amount of gratitude I feel for that. Um, but that um, wasn't always the case, and I continue to get reminders of why I'm here, because uh, uh, while I was at the gym this morning, I was I realized I dreamed last night, and, uh, and I had a freebie, and that's what I like to call a using dream, because... Um, uh, you know, because I got to use in my dream last night, but I didn't get loaded, and so I consider it a freebie. Um, and it's just, uh, for me, those are just a reminder of why I need to be here. You know, I still have, or at times can have an alcoholic mind, and um, and that's, you know, at times how that acts out, you know, and so uh, just the immense amount of gratitude for this program that I have um, just shows, you know, and just my... Uh, thought process on that whole dream I had. Um, but when I uh, showed up to Alcoholics Anonymous, I had a whole mess of problems, you know. Um, alcohol was definitely on the list, but it was a whole bunch of other things. Um, I got sober when I was 24. Um, I was about a year out of prison. And um, uh, I, I didn't really know people lived sober lives. I grew up in an alcoholic family. My dad was an alcoholic. And, um, and both my brothers are alcoholics. And, uh, and it was just what we did. I went, before I saw examples of this program, like I just didn't, I literally didn't even know people lived sober lives. Like I didn't know it was a thing um, because it just wasn't a thing that anybody started doing. Um, I started getting loaded at a very young age. I was about 12 or 13 when I took my first drink. And it was, um, it was immediate. Like I had arrived. Um, I knew this was what I wanted to do. I loved the way it made me feel, and I just surrounded myself with people that wanted to do that. And it was, you know, by the time I was in seventh, eighth grade, it was every day, um, you know, and it wasn't just alcohol. You know, we were smoking weed every day, drinking every weekend, but just that feeling, you know. Um, I wasn't drinking to escape. I just liked to get loaded. I really liked to party. Um, that hasn't changed. I just do it sober now, um, you know. Uh, it's, it's just amazing. Um, the powerlessness uh, was immediate as well. Uh, and this is hindsight, right? We don't realize it when in the, in the, in the moment. And I, I gratefully get to take a meeting to juvenile detention. And, and I talk to the kids there. And, and they say, right, they're just partying. They're just having fun. They don't have a problem. And, and I get it. You know, at that time, that's how I was too. But when I was 13 years old, luckily, for some reason, I didn't go out with my friends that night and party. But they all went into a local grocery store and, and stole beer, right? Because they didn't have money, they didn't have a source or whatever to get anything that night. And so they all got out with a 22 of malt liquor, right, down their pants. All get out, they're behind the store. I have an identical twin brother, too. And so he was the one arguing, you know, not arguing, but convincing all my friends to go back in and get more. Because that 122, like, wasn't enough. At 13 years old, that 122 wasn't enough to get the feeling he wanted. And I just, even now... And at that time, I knew I related to that. I would have went back in to get more because even at 13 years old, I know like 122 of my liquor is not enough, right? And so they all went in and they all got caught and arrested. So I'm glad I wasn't there that night because I would have been right along there with them, um, you know, but that's just how my disease manifests, you know, it's just, it's not enough. I need more. Let's go do this to get more. And, uh, and it just progressed. It just continued. My disease just progressed and continued. Um, Luckily, I had um, amazing parents, and so 
they made me continue to go to school. Like not graduating wasn't a problem or not. Yeah, I had to graduate. So I continued to go to school and, and do all that. And, but as soon as I was 18, I moved out and, uh, and school fell off and partying just became the priority. And at around that time, just more criminal activity to pursue the getting load adventures just continued. And, um, and next thing, you know, uh, I've, uh, committed enough crimes that, you know, I'm, uh, I'm getting arrested and I'm looking at a prison sentence and, uh, and it was just a, a, a matter of time or a fact of life because everybody I hung out with was doing the same things and we we're all looking, you know, at jail and prison times and it was just what it was. Um, like I said, my parents were great. And so I go to jail and there, my parents bail me out and the judge says, you know, uh, you can get out, but one, there's one multiple conditions, but one of them's not getting loaded. Right. And I'm like, yeah, sure thing. Uh, you know, but it, uh, a judge saying that to me holds no, holds no water in my life. You know, I'm powerless, you know, when I'm not incarcerated or right at that time, that was a power greater than myself. It was the only thing keeping me sober at any, at any point was when I was incarcerated. My mom used to say how grateful she was when I was in jail because she knew I wasn't in a ditch dead somewhere or whatever. Right. And so, um, you know, I get out and I continue to get loaded. It didn't, it didn't matter. And I'm, I'm facing like six years or something, five to six years was my range at that time. And I'm out on bail for about a year and, uh, I have to check in with court every month. And of course, finally they UA me and I'm, and I'm dirty. And so they revoke my bail and I go to prison and, and, um, and while I was incarcerated, I again have this power in my life that keeps me from getting loaded and, uh, my head gets clear and I start making rational decisions or I think I am right. And I figured it out. I figured it out. All these other things we're doing is my problem. As long as I don't do these other things, I'll be okay. But while I was locked up, I didn't take a look at my drinking at all. Um, I, I had no plans of drinking when I got out, but I had no plans of not drinking. And I'm telling my brothers, you know, hey, when you, when I get out, if you're doing the things we were doing before I left, like I'm not going to hang out with you. I just know I can't be around it or I'm going to get loaded. And I don't want to get loaded anymore. Right? But the insanity of it while I was in car, uh, 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 this story's probably not appropriate. So I just won't tell it, but I get out, <laughs> I get out and, um, and I make it like a day or two and then I'm out and I have a drink and, uh, and it was just instant. It was like, oh yeah, this is what I've been missing. And, and it was instant. I went and spent the next day, all the gate money I had, it was a couple hundred dollars on as much booze as I could get. And then I'm off to the races and I'm drinking how I drink again. And it took me, you know, uh, uh, that one drink and I got out on a Wednesday and Friday night, I'm getting drunk, and within a month, I was right back to where I was before I left. Gratefully, while I was incarcerated, my twin brother went to treatment, and they did some convoluted version of the 12 steps or the first four while he was in treatment. But they said, when you get out, go to a meeting. And so my twin brother, Stan, went to a meeting about Paul Anonymous his first uh, night out of inpatient, and he found sobriety. And so... I get out of prison and stand sober and, uh, and I'm like, all right. And he does what I said I was going to do. He, once I started getting loaded, Stan cut all ties with me and we're still, you know, tied to the hip to this day. We work together. We talk, we work together every day, very close. Um, and, uh, Stan cuts all ties with me because, because I'm getting loaded. He knows that if he, if he spends time with me, he's going to get loaded. He doesn't want it because he's found this program. And so, uh, for, uh, First couple months, Stan's coming around with his big book telling us how much we need this thing. And I say, that's oh, because my older brother and I are being bums that my parents still getting loaded, uh, you know, sleeping in their guest rooms, mooching off them as, uh, you know, any good alcoholic with a um, uh, mom and dad who support their habit will do. Uh, and Stan's coming around saying, you guys need this thing. You need this thing. You need this thing. And we're like, yeah, right. You know, get off your high horse, Captain Buzzkill. Like six months ago, you were right where we are now. Like, we don't want to hear it. And so Stan did that, but what Stan did was he went and talked to other alcoholics and they said, you know, be an example of this program. And if and when the time comes, uh, they'll, they'll come to you. They'll come to you. Don't, you know, force it down their throat. You may ruin an opportunity to be, you know, or ruin the program for them for later. And that's, that happened. Um, on September 18th, 2008, I woke up and I just couldn't do it anymore. You know, um, something just broke. I'd been to prison. That didn't change it for me. You know, I'd, I'd been... I'd done everything we've all done, you know, a million times over. And 
nothing was different about this date. Yeah, my girlfriend just left me, but you know that we all lose girlfriends or relationships, all that stuff. Yeah, I just got laid off my job, but I'm laid off. I'm clicking on employment. I'm union. It's you know I'll still get paid. Whatever. They'll find me another job. So none of this stuff. And I thought this all had an effect on it, and I guess maybe it did. But I was just done. I was just done, and I saw a way out. I saw a way out that was working in somebody that I knew got loaded like I did, my brother. And I called him up and I said, hey, Stan, you know, uh, what meeting are you going to today? And Stan says, I'm going to a meeting you can't go to. But he was carrying the message into a secure detox facility is what he was doing. He said, me and my sponsor, we're bringing a meeting into detox. So you need a sobriety time to go. Like he said, it, it, will you go to, if you go to see your Willie group, we'll meet you there at halftime. He said, do you think you can stay sober till then? It was like 10 a.m. And um, I found, you know, I was at a new bottom and I had no hopes of getting loaded that day, really. So I was like, yeah, I think I can stay sober. I really didn't have any resources to get loaded anyway. So it worked out my, uh, uh, you know, advantage. And so I made it to that meeting that night and I haven't uh, gotten loaded since. Um, I was told to do a bunch of things when I showed up there. You know, I was told to get a sponsor, get a home group and go to a meeting every day. And so I got sober on a Wednesday. By Friday, I had a sponsor. And by Sunday, I had a home group and I'd been to a meeting every day and I hadn't been loaded in between those things. Um, and I was like, hey, there must be something to this thing. When I first showed up here, I was just going to give it a year, right? And in that year, I was going to do everything, right? I was going to work, work your silly 12 steps. I was going to get your stupid sponsor. And when it didn't work, I was going to get loaded, right? But, uh, but I was going to do everything because then I could, you know, justify going back out. You know, when I wasn't happy and I was, you know, still sober, I was like, well, I might as well be loaded and miserable, right? And, uh, and that's not what I found. I came in here. I got a sponsor. I got a home group. I, be I started, I got, you know, forced into service, of course. Of course, right? I started making coffee in my home group. They gave me a key, you know. Uh, they started trusting me with stuff. And, uh, and I wasn't drinking in between. And that's why I showed up here is that I didn't want to get loaded anymore. I was told to do these things. And I didn't have to get loaded anymore. And it was an absolute miracle. Um, the, the opportunities I've had and the way my life has gone, it's been amazing. But when, when I first showed up and I had that first sponsor, I told him all those things, right? I'm like, yeah, he's like, why are you here? Because it was a Friday night. And I wasn't going to ask this guy to be my sponsor either. I was going to ask this other guy, Mike. And so at like halftime, I'm talking to Shane because Andy wasn't my first sponsor. Shane was. And, uh, and I was talking to Shane and Shane's like, you got a sponsor yet? And I was like, no. He says, uh, who do you think about? So I said, yeah, I'm thinking about Mike. He says, well, go, he, he said, go up and do it. Right. He said, go do it. And so I went and tried to find Mike and Mike left the meeting early and I was like, oh, okay. Well, I guess I'll come back and ask this Shane guy. I went and asked Shane and, sh and, there, and you know, and Shane, uh, he said, yeah, I'll be your sponsor. And so Shane and I started working steps, but, um, uh, I don't know where I was going with that. But <laughs> so Shane and I Shane was um my first sponsor and he was um uh, I was so on fire for this program, he was so scared of taking me through the 12 steps. He referred me to a big book workshop that he'd gone through. And so when I worked my first steps, I did it in a big book workshop with a group of people, and I found that was an amazing experience for me. But Shane started drifting away from the program and uh and I, and I needed to rework my steps. You know, I was at about five years sober and, uh, and Shane was kind of phasing out. Shane, Shane has since relapsed and he's in and out and he's, he's alive and doing well, but um, he's no longer as involved in Alcoholics Anonymous or anything like that. And so I got a new sponsor and Andy started sponsoring and Andy and I went through the steps. And, um, and uh, I found that experience to be, for me, much better going through it one-on-one -on -one with an alcoholic rather than in a big book <coughs> shop at the time. I don't know if it was what I needed, but it worked and maybe, and, um, and so I'm glad that I did that. But honestly, the, my first <coughs> resentment on my fourth step was Shane having me do it in a workshop rather than in a one-on-one -on -one setting. And so, you know, I don't know, I, I, I guess it worked, right? Cause I'm still sober and I stayed sober, but, um, I, I, I guess I wasn't that happy about it either. So. Uh, it is what it is, right? Um, what time do I? One minute. Oh, well, that's perfect. <laughs> so, <laughs> in conclusion, <laughs> I'm 
I'm just extremely grateful to be here. I'm glad I have another year. Thank you very much for asking me to speak tonight, Andy. And um, thank you all, Cox Lawrence.